Justice isn't always just, as with the near eradication of the Native Americans, the terrible imprisonment of Japanese citizens in World War II, and every other case of authorities abusing their power. The justice system can give way to public opinion and fear. People were exploring the idea of more freedoms and fighting for better working conditions, but corporations, along with police officers, gladly killed them while striking. Side note here, police violence against innocent bystanders goes a bit farther back than people seem to realize, but I digress. There was one strike in particular during the 8-hour movement that caused more than just a few dead civilians though. At a McCormick's plant in Chicago, a small group of strikers charged the strikebreakers in the plant, so naturally the police fired into the crowd. People got really angry, so they passed around a few of these army self and full force flyers. Luckily, before too many got out, August spies threatened to not speak at the meeting unless the line was cut, and it was just in time before they were more widely circulated. So at the titular Haymarket on May 4th, 1886, the meeting went mostly uneventful. Spies Albert Parsons and Samuel Fielden spoke to a crowd of 600 to 3,000 people. Yet the crowd was so calm, even the mayor said the rally would pose no threat, and told the police they can leave them alone. Plus, the weather was not the best, so people were already losing interest. So the police did what they did best, encounter and intimidate peaceful crowds. So the police ordered the rally to disperse for reasons. The speakers told the police the rally was peaceful, but they did step down. While getting off the wagon, somebody threw a bomb at the police. From witness accounts, it was madness. There were civilians running and trying to escape, while officers blindly shooting at each other and into the crowd. No one did well under pressure. The chief of police said that people who got hurt would not go to the hospital for fear of arrest. When the smoke cleared and the bodies moved out of the way, the police went berserk. Over 100 arrests were made, and warrants and other legal documents normally needed to search your home were largely ignored. The whole exchange was a mess. Raid after raid, the police sacked anything union-related. This is now known as the First Red Scare. The trial had extreme prejudice. The court refused to have a jury that showed any sympathy to the men on trial, so they had a bailiff pick the jury. Not surprisingly, the bailiff picked people who were more likely to convict. The jury also admitted bias. But the judge did not get an unbiased jury. He just continued the case, claiming if the evidence says they're innocent, they will acquit. The judge constantly ruled in the prosecution's favor, too. He denied the request for the defendants to be tried separately. No, these people would be killed as a group. The prosecution said that because they did not actively try to stop the bombing, they are equally as responsible. Even though they didn't know about the bomb until it was in the air. The newspaper clamor was insane during the trial. From the New York Times to the Chicago Tribune, accounts from large newspapers were very skewed, with headlines like, Anarchy's Red Hand, Rioting and Bloodshed in the Streets of Chicago from the New York Times, and In the Grasp of the Law, Spies, Fielden, and Other Socialists Behind Bars. From the Chicago Tribune, they are obviously trying to sway your opinion against the defendants with the way they had already made up their minds on a trial that is in the process of law were in reporting it as if they are de facto guilty, which is an issue in the way news sources are allowed to report on trials, but that's another issue for another time. Finally, they got August Spies, Samuel Fielden, Adolf Fischer, Albert Parsons, Louis Ling, Michael Schwab, George Engel, and Oscar Niebe. All of them were put on trial to prove their innocence or be executed. Although the defendants were not entirely clean, the police found bombs in Ling's residence. He had a bomb, but they could not prove he threw one. Parsons' brother claimed there's evidence the Pinkerton agency was related to the bombing, and the Pinkertons have done similar actions before. The Pinkertons were known for violence. Spies also had a pipe he claimed was a bomb to scare people out of his office. Only two of the speakers were on the wagon invisible to the crowd, but still, all of the defendants were tried as accessories of murder. 
Even though the police did not have a bomber, the argument was that they caused the bombing because of their speeches, and if the jury does not kill the defendants anyway, the nation would be in danger, now known as the national security excuse. The lead prosecutor, Julius S. Grinnell, said, Law is on trial. Anarchy is on trial. Gentlemen of the jury, convict these men. Make examples out of them. Hang them, and you save our institutions, our society. Nearly every shred of evidence the police had was acquired illegally and without a warrant. That didn't matter though. The police wanted them dead, so they were to be executed. So on August 10th, 1886, the jury ruled that every one of the defendants are guilty and to be executed. Except Neby. He gets life in prison. The defense attorney, William Foster, said as his closing argument, if these men are to be tried for advocating doctrines opposed to ideas of propriety, there is no use for me to argue this case. Let the sheriff go and erect a scaffold. Let him bring eight ropes with dangling nooses at the end. Let him pass them around the necks of these eight men, and let us stop this farce now. The lead prosecutor, Julius Grinnell, said as his closing argument, You stand between the living and the dead. You stand between the law and the violated law. Do your duty courageously, even if the duty is an unpleasant and severe one. Of course, the defendants and spouses hurried and started the appeal process, and there was a national campaign to grant clemency. The rich and the poor thought the trial was unjust, but the newspapers along the richest man in Chicago thought otherwise. Four people were executed on November 11, 1887. August Spies, Albert Parsons, Adolf Fischer, and George Engel. And when they were hanged, August Spy shouted out, The time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. But five were dead. Earlier this year, in his cell, Louis Ling committed suicide with a dynamite cap so he controlled his own means of death. Before execution, three of the defendants were granted years in prison rather than death. Oscar Niebe, as stated before, Samuel Fielden, and Michael Schwab. After six years, the last three living defendants of the Haymarket trial were finally pardoned. Yes, the police were allowed to break the law, and some do on a regular basis. Enforcing the law of law enforcers seems to rely more on the honor system more than, well, policing. The judge was not punished for ignoring the law and not allowing a failed trial, because he can't. No officer was fired for doing numerous searches and raids without any warrants. If the police... The judge and the people in the jury don't like you, no deity can save you then. The Haymarket trial did not cause the fall of the Eight Iron Movement as what may have been intended. The workers saw the Haymarket Eight as martyrs rather than vile and crazed anarchists seeking the destruction of America as the newspaper saw it. While partly causing the first Red Scare, workers stood together, fought, and got the Eight Iron Workday. The Haymarket trial caused a worldwide reaction as well. May Day slash Labor Day is a holiday this event led up to as well. Two monuments that honor the Chicago anarchists and free speech are now up in Chicago, with a park planned for the near future.